Hi students, I'm going to be talking about some transport methods within cells, usually from one side of a plasma membrane to another. And the first few methods I'm going to be talking about are what are called passive transport mechanisms. So a passive transport mechanism is one that does not require ATP. So no ATP is involved. And remember that ATP is also known as cellular currency. So this is the molecule that our cells spend in order to do any metabolic work. So filtration is a transport me mechanism that does not require ATP. It's passive. It happens regardless of um, energy input by the cell. And it can be defined as the movement of particles through a selectively permeable membrane by hydrostatic pressure. Essentially, the weight of water drives the water and dissolved matter through a filter while larger particles are held back. This is the exact same phenomenon that occurs with a drip coffee maker. Uh, you put your coffee grounds in a basket with a filter paper, and then the hot water is uh, driven through that basket, uh, the water with the dissolved solutes from the coffee passes through while the large particles, the ground coffee, remains within that filter. Uh, so again, this is the a type of passive filtration uh, that can occur in both living systems and non-living systems, as in the coffee maker. And some examples from living systems are uh, filtration of nutrients from blood capillaries into tissue fluids. Uh, basically what happens here is blood capillaries are our finest little blood vessels that perfuse all of our tissues. And uh, blood, of course, is going to flow. It's going to be pumped by the heart and then it's going to flow through a system of arteries. Um, it's going to make its way through capillaries and then back towards the heart in veins. And the capillaries are the system of blood vessels that distribute oxygenated blood throughout the body. So blood is going to be, you know, flowing through the capillaries. And there are actually little gaps that allow for perfusion of oxygenated blood throughout our tissues. Uh, so there are gaps within the capillaries, uh, very fine little gaps between the cells, the epithelial cells within our capillaries that allow for this to occur. Uh, so this is a passive process that's basically just driven by the weight of the fluid, blood, which is mostly water. Um, another example would be filtration of wastes from the blood in the kidneys. So again, filtration, passive process. Um, it is not going to require ATP. A simple diffusion is defined as the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. And again, this is a passive process, so no ATP is required. Uh, basically, this can also happen in living and non-living systems. If I were to spray air freshener in a room, you know, as soon as I spray that out of the bottle, the particles are very highly concentrated in one area. Uh, but with the random motion of the particles that were released, they are going to take the, basically take up any space available to them. So they're going to diffuse throughout the room from an area of high concentration to low concentration until an equilibrium is reached. Now that's really what all of these passive processes rely on is some sort of concentration gradient. Uh, so simple diffusion is also known as movement down the concentration gradient. With diffusion rates, there are a number of factors that affect how quickly particles can move through a membrane. Temperature, the higher the temperature, the greater the motion of particles will be, which is a measure of kinetic energy. So diffusion will happen faster. A molecular weight, larger molecules tend to move slower. So small molecules can diffuse quicker. 
steepness of the concentration gradient. Uh, the greater the difference is between one area and another, the, the greater the rate will be. Membrane surface area, hopefully this is fairly intuitive. Uh, the greater the surface area, the greater the diffusion rate will be because there is basically more area across which the particles can diffuse. Membrane permeability, again, hopefully this is intuitive. The more permeable a membrane is, the greater the rate will be. Permeability is just a measure of um, the selective nature of membranes. If a membrane is permeable to something, then it is going to allow that substance through. And cells are actually able to adjust permeability by adding channel proteins or taking them away. So we can have some upregulation of genes that code for these the production of channel proteins, for example. So just keep in mind factors that can affect diffusion rates. Again, I think most of these are fairly intuitive. Okay, so let's let's look up, look to um, osmosis. Osmosis is defined as diffusion of water across a cell membrane. So all of the principles that I've spoken of so far about diffusion also will apply to osmosis. It's literally just diffusion of water molecules. And in the context of biology, it's basically always going to be across a cell membrane from an area of more water concentration to less water concentration. And remember that channel proteins are able to act as conduits through which water molecules can pass, and those are called aquaporins. Now, if we look at this non-living system here, a setup where you have a tank, it has a semi-permeable membrane represented by this dashed line, and that semi-permeable membrane is only going to be permeable to water molecules. In this scenario, the water molecules are represented by these little dots. That's supposed to be an H, <laughs> H2O. Uh, those little purple dots are our water molecules, and then the orange dots are some sort of solute. So a solute is any substance that is dissolved in water. So we could just say that this is salt. So in a scenario like this, you can predict which way osmosis will occur, or rather net osmosis will occur. The side that has fewer solutes has relatively more free water molecules. So this side actually doesn't have any solutes since the purple dots represent water itself. So side B in this scenario is going to have more free water molecules. Those free water molecules are not attracted to ions. They're, they haven't dissolved anything. They are free to move around and they will cross that semi-permeable membrane until an equilibrium is reached. So what you would expect to see with this scenario is water is going to move from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated, from side B to side A. Now, osmotic pressure is the amount of hydrostatic pressure that's required to stop net osmosis. Hydrostatic pressure is just the force that's exerted by water or other liquid. So at some point in a scenario, a setup like this, net water movement or osmosis is actually going to slow due to filtration of water back across the membrane. So if we have basically the same scenario here, except the sides are switched. We have more free water molecules in side A, whereas side B has all of these solutes, fewer free water molecules because a lot of the water is occupied by dissolving the solutes. It's attracted to those solutes. So there's more free water molecules that can move from side A to side B. So this is a measure of net movement. The larger arrow from side A to side B represents more movement of water molecules from A to B. However, because particles are always randomly moving, 
that means there's still going to be movement of water molecules from side B to side A, but notice that the arrow is a lot smaller. That essentially tells you that there's still movement that way, but it is outweighed by movement from side A to side B. Hence, net water movement is from side A to side B. All right, so at some point, if we have net osmosis occurring from side A to side B, you're going to have the weight of the water exerting hydrostatic pressure on side B, and that is actually going to start forcing water back over to side A. Basically, this is a description of osmotic pressure. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. You might want to run, run yourself through some hypothetical scenarios. Essentially in nature, as Hank Green would say from Crash Course Biology, <laughs> Crash Course a &P, nature hates gradients. So any sort of gradient is going to be equalized if the circumstances allow for it. So if there's a semi-permeable membrane, you're going to see movement in this case of water to try to establish an equilibrium where concentrations are equal on either side. Let's look at some of the consequences of differing concentrations in cellular scenarios. So these concepts relate to what's known as tonicity, the ability of a solution to affect fluid volume and pressure within a cell. This is going to depend on the concentration and permeability of the solute. So we have three terms here, hypo, hyper, and isotonic. These are all relative terms that really only make sense when you have two or more solutions that you're comparing to. So a hypotonic solution, hypo means low. Think hypothermia. Hypotonic solution means a low concentration of non-permeating solutes. And uh, conversely, there's going to be a high water concentration. So low concentration of the solutes, high concentration of the water. In this case, a cell placed in this solution would be expected to absorb water, swell, and it may burst or lyse. Contrast that to a hypertonic solution. Hyper means more, think hyperactive. Hypertonic solution has a high concentration of non-permeating solutes, so dissolved particles that cannot pass through a membrane. And conversely, they'll have a low water concentration. So in this case, a cell placed in a hypertonic solution would lose water Water, there would be a net movement of water outside of the cell into the hypertonic solution. The cell would lose water and shrivel or crenate. And then an isotonic solution would be two solutions that have equal concentrations of non-permeating solutes. So they'd have uh, basically the same concentration, the same relative amount of free water. So um, this is often referred to as normal saline in clinical practice. So let's look at the effects of different solutions on red blood cells. Keep in mind that this, this would be a typical scenario for an animal cell placed into any type of solution. So a hypotonic solution, this would be like placing a red blood cell in pure water, just distilled water. It's all free water molecules outside of the cell. Now think about that relative to the intracellular fluid. The intracellular fluid is going to have a lot of dissolved particles in it. So all of the chemistry within the cell is going to be reflected within that intracellular fluid. That's gonna have a lot more non-permeating solutes. So, you know, we could represent this by drawing little dots, lots of dots. There basically wouldn't be non-permeating solutes out here. I'm just going to put two. So 
net movement of water is always going to be from where there's more water to less water. There's going to be a net movement of water into the cell to try to establish an equilibrium and concentrations between the ICF and the hypotonic solution outside. We would expect the cell to take on water. And eventually, this is an animal cell, it does not have a cell wall, we would expect that cell to burst or lyse. Now, opposite end of the spectrum here, hypertonic environment. This would be like placing a red blood cell in seawater. Let's say you just take a beaker full of water from the Atlantic Ocean. That's going to have a lot of dissolved solutes in it, a lot of salt. So there's actually going to be a disproportionate uh, concentration of dissolved solutes, and this time dissolved solutes in the cell are overshadowed by those outside the cell. In the extracellular fluid in this case, it doesn't necessarily have to be extracellular fluid, it would just be a hypothetical non-biological solution like salt water. Um, but same sort of principle, water is going to move from where it's relatively more concentrated to where it's less concentrated or conversely, where there are fewer dissolved solutes to where there are more dissolved solutes, you're going to have water move out of the cell. So what you're seeing here is the effects of water loss. These kind of peaks and valleys of the cell, basically this represents the cell membrane and shrinkage of the cell contents away from that cell membrane because it's losing water. So that would result in cremation. Now, an isotonic situation, this would be like our normal blood plasma and red blood cells. You're going to have same relative concentration of dissolved solutes inside and outside the cell. So yes, you'll still see water movement, but there's not going to be net water movement. You're going to see equal rates of water moving into and out of the cell. All right, so what would be the most likely scenario if red blood cells are placed in water from the Atlantic Ocean? Basically just went through this scenario, but if you need to, go ahead and pause and think about this. And then another question for fluid replacement in a clinical setting, what would you expect the replacement fluid to be relative to a patient's blood? All right, so let's move on to facilitated diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is still going to be movement of particles down their concentration gradient. Um, and because it's down its concentration gradient, no ATP or cellular energy is going to be used. However, it still requires a carrier protein. So what happens is the solute, the dissolved particle, is going to bind to the carrier protein. Carrier protein is going to change shape and then release the solute on the other side of the membrane. So again, some important terminology here. ECF is extracellular fluid. So this is fluid that's found in a living organism that is outside of cells. And then ICF is going to be the fluid that's found within the cells. This is showing the dissolved solute in red. That solute is going to interact with this carrier protein. So this whole purple coffee bean-like structure is a carrier protein. And that solute is going to bind with that carrier protein. And then the carrier protein is going to release that solute on the other side of the membrane. So this could either be solutes moving into a cell or solutes moving out of a cell. The important thing is it is down the concentration gradient. So it does not actually require energy. And you'll notice that the particles are going to be moving from where they're more highly concentrated to where they are less concentrated. Okay, so let's switch over to talking about active transport. Active transport is transport of solute across a membrane 
and instead of down the concentration gradient, it's going to be up the concentration gradient or against the concentration gradient. So we're using energy to move a solute from where it's less concentrated to where it's already more concentrated. And that is kind of against what nature naturally seeks, which is a balance or an equilibrium. Um, ATP energy is required in order to change a carrier protein to allow for this to happen. And some examples are the sodium potassium pump. Um, whenever cells bring amino acids in, um, when calcium ions are pumped out of the cell, and during endocytosis and exocytosis, which are both forms of bulk transport. So the sodium potassium pump is a mechanism that's found in our cells, and it is a carrier protein that utilizes ATP, so it is requiring cellular energy. And this pump is basically needed because the cell membrane is slightly permeable to both sodium and potassium ions. Sodium and potassium are constantly going to leak through the membrane. And I'll explain why we need the sodium potassium pump momentarily. Um, basically half of the daily calories that we consume are utilized just for this sodium potassium pump. So it is critically critically important. Um, one ATP molecule is utilized to push out three sodium ions and bring in two potassium ions. So notice that both sodium and potassium are positively charged. So what are the functions of the sodium potassium pump? The biggest function is simply a regulation of cell volume via a negative feedback mechanism. Now, as we've seen with red blood cells placed in hypo and hypertonic solutions, cell volume is critically important for maintaining functionality of the cell. If a cell takes in too much fluid or loses too much fluid, we have seriously compromised ability for that cell to undergo normal metabolism and maybe even to survive. So with the sodium potassium pump, we have what are known as fixed anions within the cell. These are things like RNA and proteins, things that cannot leave the cell. They are negatively charged particles. And those negatively charged particles that are integral to the cell are actually going to attract cations or positively charged ions. And that is going to cause osmosis to occur. Osmosis is in turn going to cause the cell to swell and that stimulates the sodium potassium pump in order to uh, basically maintain proper cell volume. So ion concentration is going to drop. Um, that's going to control the osmolarity and prevent the cell from swelling. So this is a classic example of a negative feedback loop because it is a corrective feedback loop. Another function of the sodium potassium pump is heat production. Heat is simply a byproduct of the pump. Um, another function is going to be the maintenance of a membrane potential in all cells. Membrane potential is what allows for our nerve cells and our muscle cells to function. So the sodium potassium pump essentially keeps the inside of the cell negative relative to the outside environment or extracellular fluid. That's going to be critically important for maintaining excitability of nerve and muscle cells. And if you go on to study the action potential and excitability of these cell types, um, there will be more context provided for that sodium potassium pump and why it's so important. And then finally, we also have secondary active transport, basically a piggyback function from the sodium potassium pump. Um, the steep concentration gradient of sodium and potassium is maintained across the cell membrane, and that concentration gradient acts as a form of potential energy to move other types of solutes um, into and out of the cell. 
Another type of active transport is called vesicular transport. A vesicle is essentially just a little bubble of membrane. So the outer boundary is going to be really similar to our cell membranes. A vesicle is basically just a little carrier that can transport large quantities of fluids and or dissolved particles into and out of a cell. So transporting large particles or fluid droplets through membranes in vesicles. Essentially what you have happening is these little vesicles are going to fuse with the cell membrane and release the contents on either side of that cell membrane. So this does use ATP and there's two forms of this. There's exocytosis and endocytosis. Exo, think exit. Exocytosis is transport out of the cell, whereas endocytosis is transport into the cell. And then there are several forms of endocytosis. Phagocytosis is engulfing large particles. This is also called cellular eating. Pinocytosis is when a cell takes in fluid droplets. And receptor-mediated endocytosis is taking in specific molecules that are bound to receptors. So a form of endocytosis where you have more specificity, it's not just uh, generic, we're looking to transport one specific type of molecule and that molecule will be recognized by receptor proteins.